Uh, we're going to call. Call open session to order at 7 p.m. Uh, flag salute. Matt, would you lead us, please? No. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. All right. The district digital. The digit. The, the district. <laughs> that's too much caffeine. The district digitally records the audio portion of the meetings. The recorder is located in front of the board scribe. That would be Miss Sandy Ramirez. Um, all recordings are kept in the superintendent's office for 30 days and are available during that time period for inspection by members of the public on district equipment without charge. As a community service, uh, Pacific Community Television records and broadcasts the meetings and the microphone at the uh, podium is for the, can uh, is for the camera. Okay. All right. Uh, the board met in closed session um, on three items, conference with labor uh, negotiator, public employee discipline dismissal, release and complaint, and public employee performance evaluation for superintendent. Um, no action was taken, however, at the end of this meeting we will be going back into closed session to uh, finish items that we were unable to get done in the hour that we had. Um, we need an approval of the minutes for September 17th. I know. Jones, yeah. we call uh, roll call? Oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't on, was it on the list? Did I miss that? Mm -hmm. Oh, I did miss it. Roll call. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Trustee Faust? Here. Trustee Gould? Here. Trustee Levy? Here. Trustee Bushame? Here. Trustee Weidman? Here. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, you, now that we know we're all here, approval of the minutes for September 17th? I'll move. Second. Any changes? No. All in favor? Passes by vote. Thank you. Okay, we need an approval of the agenda and the consent agenda. Uh, can I ask that we uh, remove 8G, the surplus equipment? Um, I just have a quick question about it. Okay, so the agenda um, and the consent agenda is presented with 8G removed. That will happen in the next, as soon as we finish with the vote on the, the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> I'll move it with 8G removed. All in favor? Was there a second? Yeah, Richard was our second. Okay. And that was the first? No. No. Richard oh. was the move. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I'll second. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. <laughs> sorry. We're, not We're real sticklers for Robert's rules of order. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so now we want to um, talk about HG, which is de Declaration of Surplus Equipment. So, Josie, could you give us a presentation on what that item is about? The um, item is for the 1998-28 um, passenger and wheelchair bus. The bus has broken down on the side of the road several times and had to be towed back to the um, yard. At this time, um, the cost of repairs is $3,640. The last time we spent, uh, every, every time it gets towed and brought back to the yard, it's two to $3,000 to repair. So at this time, staff does not feel that it's worth uh, keeping the bus uh, because it just costs too much to make the repairs. Okay, and how much do each of the van? How many passengers do we each have of the vans carry? We have three of the white um, vans. Okay, and how many? How many people do those carry? Right now, we're transporting about um, thirty special needs students throughout the district. Okay, I, I'm I'm good. Uh, I move approval on item AG. Is that okay. Right? Okay. Second. All in favor? Passes by vote. Thank you. Okay. All right, let me make sure. Okay, we are to communications. So, the portion of the agenda is available to the public to address the board on any issue that is not on the agenda. The maximum time allowed for any speaker is three minutes. Okay, I have several cards that don't indicate what item. So, John, Jonathan Harris, is this for, for oral communications? Okay, and Megan Ellsburn for oral communications? Yeah. Yep, yeah. and Beth Bolt. Oral okay, fine. I just want to make sure that we get it where we need to be. Um, and then Althea, that's open communications as well. And um, Alicia. Okay. All right. So, LSEA? 
Nothing right now. Okay, CSEA? Nothing at this time. Okay, all right. Okay, so Alicia Reb, is it Reb? Pond? Reb Pond. I apologize if I've missed. Oh, no okay, so if you could um, come to the podium and um, all right, that's the set. And this microphone is for the um, TV. So for those of those who watch us on TV, right I will yes. do the three minutes and I will okay. give a thirty-second warning oh, so that okay. you know when it's close to three minutes. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name's Alicia, and I have two children at Valley Mark, and I have come to ask that we adjust the lice policy. Um, a couple years ago, I think two years ago, my son's class got hit, and they had it for about four or five months. We had a lot of pesticides going into their heads, both child and then I had a baby, and we then had to treat her hair because it kept coming home. It's very expensive. It costs over $500 to get everything clean, the doing laundry, the water, buying the chemicals, spraying, vacuuming the car, everything adds up. And I don't think that we should have to keep treating our children's hair because the kids who have the nits aren't going to pop at exactly 2.40 when we get out. They just pop whenever they feel like they want to be had. And so we may not catch that one live one in their head, but there are kids that are walking around with them and then they're spreading them. So I'm just asking if when a kid gets caught with lice, would you send them home right away and then before they are able to come back, that they have to be checked correctly and make sure that they're not spreading this. It may not be a health issue, as people say, but it can cause people to be anemic. Um, it is very costly and I don't have $500. I will pull my kid out of school I will ask somebody to come home and teach my kid, but that is also not fair for my child to have to take time out of school because they're itching their head all day long. So that's what I'm asking. And I'm sure this hits all the schools because <laughs> the button look isn't so great after so many days. <laughs> okay. That's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Althea, Marchin? Alethea. Alethea, yeah, thank she, you. She pretty much said the same thing that okay. I'm going to say, and I don't want to waste anybody's time. Okay. Um, but you need to do it at the podium because people, okay. that way, believe it or not, people actually do watch, <laughs> and I actually sometimes get questions about what was said because the audio wasn't as good. Thank you. Hi. Um, we've got a number of parents who are, are feeling the same way. It's, it's, we live in an apartment and it's so expensive, so expensive, I mean, above and beyond. I don't want to be paying for it anymore. Um, I've never felt before, so I'm a little nervous. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, we're treating our kids over and over again with pesticides and the classrooms are, are, the kids are being taken out of the classroom, it's getting disrupted. Uh, it's just not fair. It's not fair for any of us. It's not fair at all. And I don't know if you guys agree, but and if you've ever had lice, because it's not. Like, and even after I was treated and my whole house was treated, I scratched for days. I was scratching in my sleep raw. It's gross. Mm -hmm. It's gnarly. And we shouldn't have to do this anymore. Yeah. And treating your kids over and over and over and over again. And then the nits or the lice are becoming resistant to it. So then what do we do? Trish Scholl. issue and um, I know before that it was no nits at school you were sent home and then it got reversed and so I'm not necessarily here tonight to argue one way or the other on that policy I think you're going to hear a whole lot of that from a lot of families at Valmar and other schools in the district um, what I would like to stress though to um, our superintendent and to the school board is perhaps this is our time really to get 
all of our parents and our kids educated. Um, I think the core problem here is that people have a stigma or a shame associated with this issue, and so they hide it. Something happens, they don't tell anybody, and then boom, it's, it's infected our schools. Um, so I don't know if the proper way is at our back to school night, but I would think you know many different means can be used. Um, just sitting home a flyer, this is what it is, some people don't even know what it is. I mean, honestly, I was a teenager on a traveling softball team and had no idea, and I started scratching my head, we shared helmets, et cetera, and next thing you know, I had it. I didn't even know what it was at the time. So a lot of it's just ignorance, and people don't realize how to treat it, what it is, um, how it spreads. So I think if we can start at educating all of our families um, with flyers through our website, back to school nights, you know, whatever it takes. But I think that's going to really help this issue. So I thank you for your time. Okay. Um, Beth Bolt. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Beth Bolt. I'm a special ed teacher at Ortega School. Tonight I have the honor of reading my friend Colleen Dillon's letter. She's a second grade teacher also at Ortega. To the collective members of the Pacific School Board, Pacifica School Board, according to the district survey several years ago, I am considered a highly qualified teacher. At this moment, I certainly don't feel like that holds any weight with you. The general perception is that the school board prefers to play ostrich, burying their heads in the sand and refusing to cooperate with an interest-based bargaining contract. It should never come to us against them. We are all in this together for the sake of the children of Pacifica. I have worked tirelessly to achieve my distinction of highly qualified. I work overtime, chair committees for language arts, was trained as a literacy coach, work hand in hand with the special education teachers to formulate plans for their push in students with great success. And in previous years, my task force have always been higher than those in the entire state. In the last five years, I have written more curriculum than a teacher should. Did you know that a curriculum writer in the private sector is paid between 52 and 58,000 a year? And they don't have to teach the curriculum. Five other subjects, whole parent conferences, write report cards, or any of the hundreds of other things a classroom teacher is expected to do. Our teachers are so good at this that other school districts are coming to see how we do it. I should be getting my salary plus that of the curriculum writers. Are you aware that there is going to be a brain drain in this district over the next couple of years as all the teachers hired in the 90s when the class size reduction was enacted began to retire? How can you attract highly qualified teachers to replace the retirees if you won't honor them with a decent wage and a benefit package that is enticing? The blunt truth is, you're not. There are plenty of other districts that have a higher pay scale. You heard last month that the younger, less tenured teachers are seriously considering leaving because they can't afford to live in Pacifica on the wages they are paid. Once upon a time, I loved my job. I would do anything asked of me with a smile on my face and an honest eagerness. Now I slog my way through the day, dreading what's coming next. What program du jour will I have, will I be asked to implement this month? How much of my own money am I going to have to spend to really make it work? Why do I even care anymore? Make me care again. Make me believe I truly am a valued employee in this district. Colleen Dillon. Megan Ellsburn and then Jonathan Harris and then Jennifer Mitchell just so people kind of know when, when you're coming up. Good evening. Last time I was here I mentioned that I like to look over the board packet each month and take a look at what's going on in and around the district and where and how the money is being spent. 
I mentioned that I had skimmed through some board packets and quickly added up nearly 200,000 spent on teachers' college workshops. With further conversations with my colleagues, it seems that the figures for my institution might be way off. This week, our CTA representative sent the district an email requesting how much money was spent on professional development in the past two or three years. The district wrote back that it would be not be able to crunch those numbers until next week. Is that because there are so many entries for professional development in our database? Are there that many numbers to crunch? Or is the district possibly avoiding giving our union some useful information before this evening's meeting? I would assume it's pretty easy to run a sort in the warrant register and add it up. Since funds are more fluid now under the new LCFF, I think this figure could greatly impact the next steps in our district. The district leadership team, which has been assisting in the development of the LCAP, is meeting soon. As a member of the DLT, we have been told that at this meeting we will be reviewing our current LCAP goals, of which we are all very familiar with goal number one, and reviewing any data that we can to measure progress toward our goals. I think data regarding how much money the district has spent on professional development would be very useful to this group. I look forward to meeting with the members of the DLT and focusing on how to continue our focus of attracting and retaining highly qualified teachers. Hello, my name is Jonathan Harris, and I'm a fourth and fifth, fifth grade teacher at Ocean Shore School, as well as co-chair of the negotiations uh, team with the Laguna de Salada Education Association. At the last board meeting, I spoke on behalf of the LSEA negotiations team, requesting, requesting that the district continue good faith bargaining using the interest-based bargaining process. My response from the board came from Joan Weideman, who said, and I quote, we respect the negotiations process and are thankful it has been conducted in a constructive and collaborative manner. We remain confident that the parties will craft a mutually acceptable agreement by bargaining in good faith. On September 30th, we met again for negotiations and nothing could have been further from the truth. The district team came to the table with one option that referred to it and referred to it as an offer. This offer was, for the most part, the same offer that was presented to LSEA at the last bargaining session, the same offer, offer that was loudly rejected by the members of this, uh, this union at the last board meeting. The LSEA team presented several options which were shot down by the district team before they declared impasse. The, in interest-based bargaining, options are presented as possibilities to be discussed in order to craft an agreement that is mutually acceptable to both parties. Offers are not part of this process. It's quite clear to the LSEA team that the district had no intention of bargaining in good faith at our September 30th session. They came to, came to hastily and recklessly declare impasse to bully their labor partners. We have only been at the table for a little over five weeks and met a few times. In my 10 years on the negotiating team, we've never come to an agreement this early in the school year. And this leads us to one of two conclusions. Either the board lied when they said that they'd respect the negotiations process and wish to bargain in good faith, or they're quite unaware that their team, led by a certain over-aggressive, highly priced Hillsborough, Hillsborough lawyer, is by no means bargaining in good faith. Neither of these conclusions are acceptable. I know most of you personally and have worked hard over the years with you to make this district one in which trust is a cornerstone. With this trust, we've rebuilt every school site while staying solvent, we've passed two parcel taxes, survived an economic downturn, and honed our curriculum and teaching practice to the cutting edge. Without that trust, who will want to pass another, ta uh, another uh, parcel tax, work long the long hours, and move to move our curriculum forward, and who will be attracted or retained to this district? Your teachers loudly decried to you what attracts them to this district, and you ignored it, offered us an unacceptable offer, and then declared what you do, that what you do, excuse me, declared that you do not even respect us enough to sit at the table anymore. 30 seconds. All the while, you've made plans to spend the money that you should be bargaining with. Your final offer to us does not even meet your own requirements. You said that you want to offer full family benefits, and your offer does not. It caps them. Your bargaining team update claims that in capping our benefits, you wish to make available about 1.5% that would go to our salary. If you really want this, make it part of your plan. Otherwise, why should we trust that you will, especially after betraying us with this declaration of impasse and wild spending? Do what's right, meet us in good faith at the table, end the impasse. This is Pacifica School District, the little district that could. Don't make it the little district that won't. Jennifer Mitchell, kindergarten teacher at Ocean Shore, and uh, my guns are going.
blazing too. Here I go. This is my 18th year in the Pacific School District. For many, many years, we were known in CTA circles as Mayberry. This was a reference to the idyllic sweet town on the Eddie Griffith Show, for those who are too young to remember. <laughs> Under the leadership of both Michelle Garside and Jim Leanity's relations between the teachers, staff, district office administration were agreeable and peaceful. Teachers felt respected and appreciated. Don't get me wrong. These were not times when money was plentiful. In fact, I distinctly remember sitting next to Jim many, many evenings cold calling for our first and second parcel tax efforts. District finances were openly discussed with all stakeholders. There was an honest feeling of being in this together. Sadly, Pacifica is no longer Mayberry. The teachers and staff all made sacrifices during the recession and subsequent lean times. We thought we were all in this together as we had been in the past. Unfortunately, this has not proven to be the case. Now that there's money flowing into the district coffers, there di there's a distinct feeling that the efforts and sacrifices we made during lean times are forgotten and completely unappreciated. Sure, there's plenty of lip service given to how much teachers and staff are appreciated, but there's no real money on the table for us. This offer of a soft cap on benefits actually represents a loss of salary for some folks like me. For those who continue to use Kaiser, their raise will eventually be absorbed by the benefits cap. In addition to the proposed benefits cap, there's a sense that there's a shell game going on with the money that is available. I'm constantly hearing rumblings about additional staff that the district is contemplating hiring, most of whom would have little direct contact with actual real students. Over the past several years, a significant amount of money has been spent on staff development and other extras. The true cost of all these items seems to be shrouded in mystery, despite the fact that the budget is supposed to be available. Teachers were promised extra money in their salaries on at least two occasions in the past several years. In fact, the money generated has not been spent on teachers, as was promised to taxpayers. At least not teachers who have direct contact with students. Some of the extra money for teachers' salary has been spent on coaches who have limited interaction with Pacifica children, or the teachers for that matter. Much of their time is spent doing administrative work. Those who aren't teachers, or those who aren't teachers, the those aren't extra teachers or increased salaries, as far as I can tell. One of the stated district goals is to attract and retain good teachers. I'm a good teacher. I'm a dedicated teacher. I wanted to you a few weeks ago, I am seriously thinking about leaving this district after my youngest child graduates eighth grade. I cite my reasons as the lack of financial transparency that is pervasive in this district and the lack of interest and regard that the board has demonstrated in regard to the thoughts and opinions to the, of the teachers and LSEA. I've attended many board meetings over the years. Continually I hear how much the board appreciates me and my colleagues. It's nice to hear, but it has a hollow ring when followed by a cut in benefits when there is money available. Forgive me if I find it hard to believe you really do appreciate my hard work. Okay, so I have Patty, and then I have uh, Patty McNally, and then Isla Dwyer, and that's the last card that I have. Okay. Good evening. Patty McNally, 650 Talbot Pacifica. I look up at the Board of Trustees, and I see people that I've known for many years, that I've taught their children, people who I know have spent countless hours volunteering in classrooms throughout the district, some even sleeping on the cold wet ground or, or over a hot beehive oven, with teachers of the district trying to deliver the highest standard of education to our children. I look at the board and I see people who teachers have worked side by side with to raise money for music in this district or a family in need in our community. I see people that we've spent hours phone banking or walking the streets of Pacifica delivering the message to support parcel tax. I look at the board and I see people who I personally respect and felt had listened to their constituents and the teachers and staff of this district, that they believed as I do, that Pacifica School District is a unique place where there is a strong positive morale and work ethic and we are, are proud of who we are. No, we're not the same as San Francisco. 
or Fresno, or Hillsburg for that matter. Our history is different, and the sacrifices made by the people before us need to be respected. I look at this board and I'm saddened and confused, and I see people who are unfortunately not hearing the message of teachers, who are listening to a high-priced attorney who seems to enjoy going to impasse. I see people who in times were tough came to their staff and asked us to be good labor partners to keep this district solvent by taking furlough days, larger class sites, no preps, no stipends for committee work. But even in the worst of times, the board knew the importance of maintaining benefits. I sat at the table and understood when times were better, things would change and it would be your turn to reinstate things that were cut and it was your turn to be good labor partners. Well, the time is now. Even Chicken Little would have to admit the sky is not falling. Money is finally coming into this district. So, as this new money is being spent, and even though in our LCAP it states that the number one priority is to attract and retain highly qualified teachers, the board insists to cap benefits. The board may call this cost containment, reallocation of funds, not sustainable funding, but to teachers in this district, this is a cut. So I look at the board and I ask you to think about the damage that will be done to this if this action continues, done to us if this action continues. The time it will take to rebuild the morale, the trust, the respect between people in this district. And at the end of the day, who will remain to keep Pacifica School District the district of choice? I know it won't be that high-priced attorney who appears to be driving this runaway train. He will be long gone with money in his pocket and certainly will not be here to pick up the pieces or help phone bank or fundraise or walk the streets to help pass the next parcel tax. No, the people who will be here will be the teachers, your staff, your community. So I ask the board to please use the power that you were entrusted with to stop this action, to direct your negotiators to go back to the table and use the IBB process to come up with a settlement. This is not the time to continue cuts. This is the time to rebuild, to reinstate, and enhance the total compensation package promised and so well deserved. Thank you. My husband started his career here in this district in 1991. He taught at Ortega Middle School for 10 years. During this time, we started a family and he consciously began to think about how best to provide for all of us. <clears throat> Since we are a low paying district, he made the decision to leave for a distri district that offered close to double his salary. I started my career here as well. And even though my husband pushed constantly for me to move so I might be paid what he thought I was worth, I chose to stay. My reasoning was always the benefit package and what it contributed to my family. But it was also the sense of community I feel here and my desire to give to the place I live. I hope that I stand as yet another example of the countless teachers in this district who chose to work here knowing our pay was among the state's lowest, but have the consolation that our salary is offset by our current benefit package. Please don't make it seem that I made a huge mistake. And that is all the, oh, another card from Pat? No, oh, sorry. Okay. All right. I just uh, I don't want to make sure that I didn't miss anybody. Okay. All right. I, I just, okay. All right. Um, on behalf of the board, we are united. We are unified in the support. The we are un. We are un. Uh, 
It's too much coffee. We are unified in support of the proposal presented at the last negotiations meeting. We look forward to the mediator's assistance in reaching an agreement. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next item is correspondence. No correspondence. No correspondence. Board Superintendent Communications. <laughs> Does anybody want to start? Uh, I attended the memorial service for Jim Vreeland, city council member who passed away. Uh, also attend. It was down at the beach. It was quite moving, actually. Uh, I attended the meet and greet for uh, Joe DiCarlo the Success Summit up at Skyline College and the uh, last collaborative here at the district last week. Nothing too dramatic from any of them. But there is a, a string of, of the, both the Success Summit and the collaborative or the, just the need for agencies to co work together. And uh, I mean, I really think it's a time, one of the only plus sides have gone through the recession is a, a lot of uh, barriers between agencies working uh, at cross purposes, I think have come down. Oh, good. Richard, you want to go? Sure. Uh, so for me, it's been a slow couple weeks. Actually, uh, we had the candidate forums, of course, and then uh, we got to uh, kind of put on a little bit different hat and, and uh, went out with our uh, PSV director and got to visit both of the high schools and talk to the principals at both of the high schools and uh, see a little bit of what's going on there. Are we going to close the windows? So thank you. All right, Matt. Uh, I was also uh, here to say hi to Joe and at the Sunset Ridge Candidate Forum. Uh, I spent some time at uh, FogFest working with some candidates for the high school board. I did the Sunset Bridge back to school night, and it's back to school night and barbecue. Um, the Joe meet and greet, uh, candidates forum, Giants game, movie night at Sunset Bridge. Um, well, I attended the both of the candidates forums in the last couple weeks. So, Wendy. So I'd like to thank um, Eileen Manning Millar and Connie Menifee who served as our moderators um, during those two forums. Um, it's, it's really nice to be able to um, have uh, people who have a connection with us and come back and um, help us through the process of getting to know all of our candidates. So um, it was, I, I thought, a, a nice event. We will be having our uh, SVMI professional development on Monday for our professional development day so we're looking forward to that and um, hoping that it will be again a strong opportunity for the teachers to continue to work on their common core standards and mathematics. 
Okay, um, so we are on to board curriculum display. So I have the pleasure of introducing um, Monica LaVeo, who is principal of uh, Valamar School, and she will be doing the presentation to the board um, in relationship to the display. Hi, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and start um, on this side of the room with Carrillo. Communication is at the heart of everything that we do as human beings. Our students learn to communicate about feelings, express their needs, understand the needs of others, and the whole community through well-rounded communication skills. In the 21st century, one of the top priorities of employers is whether or not employees have solid communication skills to work with one another and the clientele that the company serves. Our display shows various ways that we communicate with one another at Cabrillo to build a strong community of lifelong learners. Ms. Ms. Welch, Richards, and Mrs. Hayes SDC classes. Students use icons to express their needs and transition from one activity to another. For the first day of school, students in Ms. Crane's kindergarten first grade combo class got to express how they felt about coming to school on the first day. Others in Ms. Donnelly's class have been working on how to work and play with others by making sure that they fill their buckets with kindness and compassion. As students move through the grades, they learn the importance and power of words through expressing their thoughts and feelings about particular words of their choice through one little word, a fifth grade activity in Ms. Sullivan and Ms. Panchik's class. Upper grade students communicate with one another and their teachers using Edmodo and Google Docs. While we introduce them to appropriate ways to speak to one another on social media, texting, and email with the Common Sense Learning Curriculum. By the way, the Common Sense Learning website is a wonderful resource for parents who may have questions about the ever-growing internet and age-appropriate movies, games, and online sources for children. The entire school receives weekly communication through teacher newsletters and the weekly electronic envelope, which includes news of the PTO and the principal's weekly newsletter. Moving on to Ortega. Ortega's display represents the different ways that our students communicate at our school. Pictures show the students thinking, talking, and writing about their work. The flowers represent the blooming of their ideas. And now, uh, Ocean Shore. Diane Barhuti's third grade class recently went to the San Francisco airport for a field trip. The kids focused on how technology is used all over the airport and how people and objects move around the airport. These two areas focus on communication working well in order to facilitate the, that people and items get to where they belong. The students considered how people might be communicating, observe techniques for communicating, watch for signs and other clues that allow for clear communication while they were on their tour. The students theorized about ways that make communication more effective and efficient. In one example on the wall, students practiced using the aviation alphabet that pilots use by writing out their names using the alphabet. The pictures reflect signage and other aspects of communication from vests to tags. The last example is of the children's writing experience of, the, of reflecting on their day with the title Communication at SFO. And Sunset Ridge. At Sunset Ridge, we encourage and celebrate communication across all subject areas in every setting. Sunset Ridge's communication board shows some of the ways that our children use communication <coughs> skills. Our second graders started off the year writing poetry. They did a gallery walk in their classrooms and then got a chance to read their poetry to their classes. Students are also doing math talks. You can see a poster from Ms. Campbell's third grade class. Number talks are an opportunity for children to converse and explore their mathematical thinking. Students not only learn that communication is expressing their ideas, they learn that communication requires good listening skills. In art classes, students spend time doing charcoal figure drawings. After drawing their figures, they got to spend time looking at the art. Afterwards, they got to create, critique each other's pieces. Students did written critiques as well as verbal critiques. You can download a QR reader on your phone and see the children doing the critiques. The children learn how to be respectful to each other and share their thinking, and the artist gets to listen how their art affects others. It is truly amazing thing to see. I hope you take the time to look at the video clips. 30% of our students speak a language other than English. Providing students with these rich academic discussions provides all students the opportunity to share their thinking and to improve their listening skills as it develops a deep appreciation of each person's uniqueness. 
now move to the back wall, um, starting with Valimar, <coughs> my favorite school, of course. <laughs> Valimar, communication is a way of exchanging information, learning from each other, and making connections with others. Group work and communication are central to many of the activities you will see at Valimar daily. Students communicate with each other to discuss their math thinking, through problem of the month activities, and large tasks. Not only are there rich math math discussions in finding the solution, but in the process of creating the model poster and presentation to share with the class. Another activity where students learn from each other and push their own thinking is matching cards. Students are given a set of math cards to match up. The cards have multiple representations of the same math problem, and students must communicate to match them up. Our counselors, staff, and peer helpers assist students in using conflict resolution strategies such as talk it out inside and outside the classroom. These strategies are shared through class presentations, role playing, and assemblies. Then they are reinforced on the yard and around school through interactions with each other. Students are encouraged to use productive and positive talk every day at Valor. And now Lindemar, LMEC. At Lindemar, communication is demonstrated through a variety of means, including gestures, body language, pictures, sign language, vocalizations, and words. Students are learning that they can use specific tools, such as the picture symbols displayed, to say what they need. At preschool age, verbal communication may not be the dominant way many students express themselves or interpret the world around them. Preschoolers often communicate through their body language, play, and art. The teachers and staff at LMEC make every effort to capture teachable moments for communication throughout the day. This occurs during snack time as students are given opportunities to make requests for food and drinks. Time as students are given during circle time as students communicate with peers through music, calendar activities, and books, and even at recess as students are encouraged to make turn taking requests. Teachers then take these learned skills and work on generalizing them to unfamiliar social situations in the community, such as during a recent field trip to the Pacifica Gardens, where students practiced making requests to have a turn pulling carrots and saying more or all done after tasting a new food. And finally, um, IBL and Lacey. Communication is a process in which all living beings use to express and convey thoughts, information, feelings, and ideas with one another, and the world around them. Communication is a skill that needs to be taught in order for children to develop and mature. Communication will be the key to future success in school and the world beyond. At IBL, our students communicate their thoughts and ideas in a variety of ways. In math, Students worked in pairs to collaborate and submit their work. Students communicated their struggles and achievements <coughs> with the problem of the week with a poster named Measuring Up, based upon mathematical concept of proportions. The problem contains different levels and students chose to communicate their critical thinking related to the math work. Language arts classes work in both reading and writing to support students in their development of skills that allow them to access a variety of text types and to communicate their understanding across the curriculum. These photos show students communicating as individual writers, as partners in thoughtful discussion, and as members of group seminars. Technology allows students, teachers, and peers to collaborate and give feedback on work throughout the writing process and to share ideas about favorite books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of good stuff going on. <laughs> I think what's sort of interesting about this is, you know, when we say communications, we think about reading and writing and speaking, but really this has brought out a lot of things about art, about math, about visuals, um, different languages. I mean, it's really an interesting, communication is pretty complex and the ability to teach children on all those levels is pretty, pretty amazing. Okay. All right, the next item is an update on the Prop 39 uh, California Clean Energy Act. And tonight we have a presentation from uh, Mr. Andrew Myman from ARC Technologies. We have a PowerPoint, and if you give me the I'm Andrew Lyman, uh, also known as Andy. 
um, <laughs> principal and co-founder of Arc Alternatives, uh, which is a clean energy consulting company. And uh, I'm uh, one of three partners. We just started this business up in uh, January. I'm working from Pacifica, so I'm a local business. Um, I, I know you all don't think about uh, Proposition 39 in energy every day, and that's why you hired us. So I'm going to start with a little um, overview and background of uh, what Prop 39 was. Talk about um, benchmarking, which is how we compare the district's energy use to other schools, and then get to the meat of it, which is um, audits and the expenditure plan, which is the uh, required document from the California Energy Commission in order to get um, money to invest in energy upgrades. So November uh, two years ago, their California passed Proposition 39, which uh, resulted in, in hundreds of millions of dollars actually in additional tax revenues to the state, half of which was dedicated to schools for energy upgrades. Um, Pacifica School District it could, could see approximately um, $530,000 over these five years. Uh, so far, the first year allocations, which were fiscal last year actually, um, the district was allocated $133,000, 130 of which, 130,000 of which was uh, approved for planning and assistance over the five-year period. Um, the future allocations for the next four years, we actually expect to be a little bit lower um, based on tax revenues and um, uh, corporations figuring out how to get around the loophole <laughs> closure um, as the years go on. But we still think, and we've heard some additional numbers for next fiscal year already, um, that are about 75%, so we're seeing an allocation of approximately $100,000 a year for the next four years. Um, the, the key here is that you, you're you eligible for the money, but you have to actually do some work and apply for it to get it, and there are some constraints in the way you spend it, and the main constraints are that um, you must follow what's called loading order in California, and that means you got to do all your efficiency first, energy efficiency first, and that means reduce your load before you go out and buy solar panels, for example, to uh, serve the load. And so it's really efficiency first and renewable energy second. Um, there's uh, quite a process that is in place, as you can imagine, with the California Energy Commission and the California Department of Education. Um, they laid out essentially a, sort of an eight-step program. We are at step seven. Uh, we've, we've sort of, uh, the first two steps are the gathering data and comparing against what, um, you know, prioritizing uh, and comparing against other schools and figuring out where we might be able to make big impacts. And then the steps three through six are really um, sort of an iterative process to figure out which projects are the best projects, which one makes sense economically, prioritize those, and then you know, um, come up with a plan, which is where we are on step seven. Um, on the benchmarking front, which is the comparison to how you, you know, other districts and how you use energy here, um, we, we found um, some pretty typical things. Um, uh, in some regards, and, and but overall, that the district is very efficient and, and really doesn't use a lot of energy. And I think there's a lot, of, you know, as we know from living in this environment, that we don't have a lot of air conditioning, so that's that's a big deal. But the district still does spend three hundred and forty thousand dollars approximately annually on energy. So you know, there's 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 some money there, and if you can save some of that, um, you know, it's well worth the effort. Um, the interesting thing is that another interesting thing is, is you spend most of your money on electricity, which also is fairly typical and not not that surprising. But 90 plus percentage of the money is spent on electricity. While we don't have a lot of air conditioning, we don't have a whole lot of heat either. So there's not a lot of gas use. Um, compared to other schools in California, uh, Pacifica is low, and a lot of it again has to do with no use of air conditioning, but it also has to do with some of the upgrades in the newer facilities that the district actually has and has been working over the, the past several years where they can to upgrade lighting, for example, and um, really do uh, use energy wisely and, and um, you know effectively. And there's not a lot of waste, there's really not. Uh, the one exception is the district office line there, which is a little bit of a, <laughs> that was a good example of how we, like, why is that the way that is? And, and the reason is, um, well, there's two reasons. One, it's compared to schools instead of offices. And so as a district office where there's, you know, a longer day typically and 
you know, year-round operation, you would expect it to be a little higher. But the big driver, and you'll see where this come up again later, is that the walk-in freezer out there in the shop is on the meter mm -hmm. for the district office. And so that is actually a, an opportunity to save some energy. Yes? Andy, C-E-U-S? Oh, that's the California End Use uh, Survey. And it's okay. California, yeah, California okay. End Use Energy Survey. There's an extra so at the bottom, what does that note mean? SSR gas EUI estimate? <laughs> that's, uh, that's my uh, reminder to say that the, um, <laughs> the uh, Sunset Ridge gas um, is an estimate of, we didn't have good meter readings from Sunset Ridge, so we're working with PGE to actually get the right number, but we estimated it okay. based on the store. Thank you. Yeah. See, now we have to learn a new set of acronyms <laughs> beyond education. Yeah, we have to. If you want to, you know. No, thank you. I don't have that capacity. <laughs> yeah. Um, so even though the benchmark results show that we're low, we use low energy or have low energy use here in the district, there are opportunities. In fact, um, you know, there are always opportunities to, to save energy and money. And I think that's a recurring theme as we're, we're, we're seeing this in other districts as well. Um, some districts that have a lot higher energy use have done a lot more specific energy efficiency. You know, they still have a ton of potential to save. So we found actually one and a half million dollars worth of projects that we could do. Um, and I'm not going to go through this whole chart. It's sort of for your reference, and um, you'll see it again here. Uh, this is a sort of trimmed down version of that 1.5 million. Uh, you know, since we don't have 1.5 million to, to you know spend on energy projects. And we have to meet certain economic criteria, which is called a savings to investment ratio. That's one of the big ones that the Energy Commission is requiring and the Department of uh, Education is requiring. That you know, you're, you basically have to have a, the savings that you would see from your um, investments have to be greater than the investment over the life of that project. So there's a calculator that we run and, and have to meet this criteria. It actually has to be a 1.05. Um, so it has to actually exceed by 5%. The amount, the amount of savings has to exceed by 5% what the investment is. Um, <clears throat> so we've, I've got the next slide, we'll summary project types here. But you know, here again, for your reference, and then and sort of the takeaway, one of the takeaways is that these projects do result in savings. You know, and that, that you're getting money to invest, and the net outcome of that is going to be about $50,000 a year in savings on, on the utility bill alone, and we'll expect also some additional savings in maintenance um, that are not quantified here. So that's an annual savings stream that should last out as long as the projects last. And that also doesn't include the expected rate increases that we all you know, can expect as, as, as time goes on. So I'd say that's a fairly conservative number. So then what are we talking about? The projects themselves um, are at all sites across the district except for Oddstat because uh, you know given the constraints and the fact that Oddstat is a surplus and rental school we you know, had plenty of other higher uses for the money um, and we had to go after those projects with the highest impact within the funding anticipated available for the projects and um, those are really exterior um, some advanced lighting exterior lighting uh, again the district has done some but there's some additional out there that's a little harder to get to and, and, and we can tackle that as a part of the program. There's some interior lighting and controls. And um, do you have a question? No, not on okay. um, There's uh, a couple, a smaller project about instantaneous water heaters instead of the big heaters that are out there in the closet. You know, you can put a little no. heater in there that only works when you need it, and that fits very well with the way water is used in the district. Um, and then the walk-in freezer, of course, where we think that uh, we can save some significant energy just by, by upgrading that thing out in the shop. Um, so once we've got the projects identified, we also have to think about how we want to implement those projects. And uh, one of our drivers here is to match the annual funding flow and so that we don't get ahead of ourselves. We could, but um, you know, we really wanted to try to match the amount spent with the amount that's allocated in the year. We also wanted to do this in a way that was flexible so we could um, do those projects that are pretty well defined with money that we know is already allocated. And then in future years where I think it's a little less certain, we could either scale, we could use projects that could scale up or down based on the allocation. And so we want to do the, um, the exterior lighting, the walk-in freezers, the water heaters first, 
and then over time tackle the lighting and controls because those are ones we can ramp up or down and still see good savings. And this, this is really just a conceptual graphic of the way we're trying to match up the funding flows with the inflows with the outflows. And, and um, you know, once we, in year one now, you know, we're, we're just getting started, so we're not even close to spending the allocation. In year two, we'll try to catch up, and then years three through five, we'll try to match it um, straight out. And the next steps really um, come after the after we submit this expenditure plan and get approval from the CEC. Um, there, its expenditure plan is sort of a oversimplification. There are 24 documents at last count, 24 separate documents, uh, applications, and supporting documents for the CEC for this. So we get all that in, and um, we uh, we actually have another client up in Chico who. We had done this exercise for back in June. We just got word that they got theirs approved on, on Monday. So and that was a $2 million plan. So I have some confidence that we'll get through, and hopefully we'll get it through fast. I mean, they took 75 days about to get that one done. So you know it, it is on that couple month time frame plus. Um, but we have a pretty good sense that we'll, we'll get it through. And we've tried to use their tools as much as possible in order to make it even easier for them to just check it off. Um, so really we need to wait until that, that is done, I think. Um, we can get started on some of the things in the meantime if we want to get a head start on some of the advanced planning and possibly some um, early uh, scope of work and specification development. But uh, for the most part, we're, you know, we're at that point. We need to submit the plan, get the approval, and then we can really move. And that is all. Actually, I wanted to acknowledge Josie and Joe DiCarlo and um, Mark Clausen, the district electrician, who all had input and helped out a lot to uh, walk us around the district and, and talk about what priorities we should have and what we should do. Any questions? Um, Eric and then Andrew. On page uh, eight, the chart, uh, the expenditure plan, um, at the bottom you have custom projects, approximate SIR. Yes. That means what? That is the savings to investment ratio that I was talking about, and so that's that. Uh, by the uh, energy commission that has to be greater than 1.05. And so that is the saving, the net present value of the expected savings stream divided by the cost. And is, so you're not at a point where you're gonna prioritize the order to do these projects and yet? Not based on the SIR, um, but based on the, I mean, we, we did have to prioritize, we had to cut that list from 1.5 million down mm -hmm. to the, Four hundred thousand. Right. And, and so we did use it for that. Okay. And then the next sort of passive prioritization was more about um, doing those well-defined projects first uh, with the money that we know we have allocated. And then you know, in future years where it's a little more uncertain, we can ramp up or down as necessary. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I you know I, I like the idea that you know this is. We're going to save money. Um, that we're going to use money from the state, but I also want to know if these kind of projects make us greener. Um, yeah, they do definitely. So, and, and how does that work? So every um, kilowatt hour and every therm that you save or don't use is an avoided greenhouse gas emission, and so that in and of itself makes you greener. Um, I don't recall the conversions off the top of my head, but we can do that number. In fact, I should have put it in here. That would be a good thing to do, and we can always attach those carbon savings. Pretty straightforward uh, exercise. It's just a math problem. You know, you can attach the carbon savings to the energy savings and the dollar savings. All right. It's a good, good suggestion. Did you have a question, Matt? No. So we, we need to match the funds? For this for these projects or is nope. it 100% of the funding? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Because we receive on an annual basis for the next five years, correct, right. funding out of this Prop 39. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if there is conversation about any expansion or extension of this. You know, I have, I've just heard little sort of murmurs about it, but I, I haven't heard anything definitive. Um, I, you know, Probably, and I would I would advocate for it, and, and that 
not to spread the same amount of money over more years, but get more years right. of funding would be a, would be a great thing. So I'm sure that uh, there's somebody working on that already. Yeah. Uh, if I could, a quick follow-up. So you're looking about a 15% savings after all of these projects are implemented. Right. Are there any projects that are of such use that we should consider trying to fund them from other sources? That's a good question. Um, we, you know, there are some projects that were just on the on the edge um, of, you know, if we had an extra hundred thousand dollars, it would make sense. It would have met the investment. Um, criteria um, but the, the reality was actually that our job of prioritization was pretty clear-cut when we sat down with, with Josie and Joe that the, the, it just happened that the, the good projects were, were right around that number of the actual funding you had and the ones that were more marginal were you know some of them were very much more marginal and so it's not um, I mean I think there might be a few but I don't think it's a it's not it's not a million and a half dollars Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very right. much, Andy. Thank you. Um, so the next item is a public hearing statement of assurance. Uh, sorry, it's been a long day. Do you need less caffeine or more caffeine? <laughs> <laughs> assurance for pupil textbooks and instructional materials, and this is this is an action item. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is. Oh wait, this is a public hearing. Public hearing. Okay, hold on. We got to make sure that so we're on the right. We're, we're fine. We're great. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. So we get a, we'll get a presentation. We'll open the public Let's hearing try. for comment, and then we'll have discussion. Okay. okay. So Thank you. I will present. Um, this is this resolution is due to Education Code six zero one one nine, which uh, requires the governing board to uh, hold a public hearing and to make a determination through a resolution that each pupil in, in the school, in each school in the district um, has or will have prior to the end of the fiscal year sufficient textbooks or instructional materials. So um, we're happy to, to note that we do have the materials at the schools. Um, we do a cycle and we're trying to tighten that timeline even more of starting to order in the spring for the next year so that we have the, the books and materials available for the teachers upon their return uh, in August because they all like to count them, etc. cetera. Uh, we purchased consumable books and we replaced textbooks that um, have been lost. Uh, one of the things that we're finding as with the um, adoption of balanced literacy is that we have less use of the hard textbooks, so we have been able to uh, provide uh, chunks of dollars to teachers to order for their classroom library the leveled books. So we're really trying to beef up classroom sets of leveled books in, in each of the classrooms. Any question? Or open for public hearing? Okay. We're gonna, it's 8.03. We're going to open public hearing. Any public comment? No public comment. Close public hearing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, anything from the board? Well, if you're swinging that hammer, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do we need to approve this declaration? We will, yeah, we, we're going to have to vote here in a second. Um, can we shift some of that money for um, the uh, textbook adoption? Because I know we, we, had sh we had set aside some of the um, common core money for textbooks, and then we spent it on technology. So, yes. Okay. So the answer <laughs> in, a, in, a short, in a short in a short, short way, yes. Okay. So and we have we have been doing um, some movement of textbook, but I don't I don't necessarily know. Are we getting textbook dollars like they have no the everything with LCFF is local control, so we're not getting the only money we're getting is the lottery, the restricted lottery, which is specifically designated for instructional materials, including okay. textbooks. So if you're and I, so I think you're talking about the co those the common core right. money and we, I, yeah yeah so from a budgetary perspective we had set aside common core money for the math textbooks but then because we weren't ready to buy the textbooks and we needed the technology we spent it on technology so we'll, we need to start 
putting money aside for future textbook adoption? Is that what right. we need to do? It's a little bit in the budget? Yeah. Joseph? When we closed the books um, the last two years, we had approximately 150000 of textbook money set aside. Okay. Um, we were not able to add to it this year when we closed the books, but ideally I think you need about, what, 400000 yeah. for a math adoption. And so there's 150000 and then as we can, we'll, maybe the state will provide more funding or we'll try to add to it for the math adoption. Okay, so that's just a th thing to keep kind of in mind when we're doing budgets. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Um, are we have, do we have a motion? I move that we approve resolution 2014 10 08 A. I read that. Second. All in favor? Okay, thank you. All right, so now we're on to uh, Constitution Day. This is a information item. Right. This is just an information item. Um, Constitution Day is an American federal observance that recognizes the ratification of the United mm -hmm. States Constitution. And uh, in Pacifica, our sites observe Constitution Day on September 17th to the, oh, should say 2014, sorry. Oh in various mm -hmm. ways. And so, well, let's did pretty, it yeah, we did it last year too. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> you, you need to do it annually, and it has to be observed on September 17th. So, um, listed for your number of things that the schools do to commemorate uh, Constitution Day. And so, uh, I do need to um, share that I think that we, we try to take this uh, opportunity to remind students of of our government and um, the students have the opportunity to do some fun activities to to really talk about citizenship and, and what our government, how our government works. Okay, so uh, the next thing is the final teacher assignments for 1415. This is an information discussion item. So um, every year we want to acknowledge um, all of our teachers in their current assignments and the list uh, that was provided for the board lists all the names of our Pacifica School District teachers and their respective schools grade levels and so forth where they're assigned for the 14-15 school year and um, it also gives you our staffing details and as I had mentioned at the last board meeting um, we are based upon enrollment and staffing work at um, equitable allotments. Okay. All right. We have any comments, questions? Okay. Um, now we're into public report on developers' fees. This is an information discussion item. Okay. Every year we bring this item to the board. <coughs> um, it's one of the requirements for the board to um, provide to the public the developer fees that are earned and how they're spent. And so developer fees are basically earned in Pacifica when there's construction, when someone's constructing a home or remodeling a home. The Jefferson Union School District levies the fee, and then it's divided between uh, Pacifica and Jefferson, and Jefferson also um, levies the fees for Brisbane and Bayshore. So we get a report every month for um, what was earned in each district. The last few years, we haven't really received a lot of funds for developer fees because there hasn't been a lot of construction in Pacifica. Um, you know, as, it, as, the, as the construction picks up, we'll start to see more fees. In the past, we had been spending the fees um, coupled with modernization as, because you have to spend the fees when, where there's growth. So if there's growth, like there's construction being built on Fassler. So if those if houses generate developer fees, then you should use the funds in the area that, it, that the fees were earned, like you could add something to Ortega or the schools nearby. So we haven't done anything the last couple of years, um, and there isn't really a large balance in the in the fund right now. It's just under a hundred thousand. That's one of the things I'm going to be working with um, the new director of facilities on, as we look at the enrollment and capacities. Is there um, some modular buildings that can be purchased for the north side of town because that's basically where the fees have been earned? Um, we're going to start looking at how we can spend those funds and bring it a plan forward to the board as, as we determine how those funds can best be spent and what we could do with just under a hundred thousand um, because modular buildings cost much more than that um, the other thing was we had discussed in the past the board had asked about technology 
and you really can't use these funds um, for technology even though it was part of our infrastructure to um, redo our, our wireless, um, you really need to stick to structural facilities um, type purchases when you use these fees. So um, currently we didn't, we didn't do anything last year. The report shows the interest earned and the fees earned and, and the ending fund balance. And we did make the required postings at the libraries and um, the district 10 days prior to the board meeting tonight. Now, if there's questions or comments, Matt? Yeah, so, so do we keep track of where every dollar in this fund was earned so that we could spend it in there? That not, seems not really odd. No, <laughs> not necessarily, but the intent is, and we have a report, a developer fee report, the intent is to use it in areas of growth. And with us being an open enrollment district, mm -hmm. it would be pretty hard to say, oh, I the, see. You know, there was it, it, it'd be difficult to keep track of it that way. But when we do spend it, we want to be justified in that it's in an area where there's enrollment growth or you know, population growth. Okay, I see that makes sense. Okay. So how much? So it was. I know during the downturn of the economy, it was pretty um, level. What did we earn last year? We earned. Let's see, fifty-five thousand. So that was. You know, in the last few years, that's the, probably the most we've earned. So I guess one of the things is, as you're looking at this, if you find a project that's maybe 110, 120, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if worth or it's waiting. worth waiting a little bit so that we get the the thing, the whatever it is that we want, if we're if we're growing. Right. Bias curtain rate. Right? So what is the estimated cost for a modular? Oh, I don't have okay. that on the top of my head, but they, I mean, even moving those po the old mm -hmm. portables from Cabrillo to Sunset Ridge and Ocean Shore was well over 100000 Just hiring the company to mm -hmm. pick them up, move them up the hill, and set them was, uh, was over $100,000. So. Well, it also depends if you've got to lay infrastructure like um, electricity and mm -hmm. gas and all of that. Which we're replacing modules that are replacing we, we would need to hire like an architect or a firm to help us design whatever projects we anticipate. Okay. All right. Our favorite part of the meeting, guys, is <laughs> board policies. I believe speak for yourself would be an appropriate <laughs> response. <laughs> you, you make me feel bad. Okay. Good. Here we go. Um, so this is this is item 12A, which is the April uh, manual maintenance, and under that is board policy 3260, which is uh, fees and charges. Changes. Sorry. And then the AR 3260 that goes with that. The how to. Um, let's see, that was all under that item. We're into August uh, 12B, August 2014. Oh, goody, there's lots here. Mm -hmm. um, so board policy 1330, which is use of school facilities. Sandy, is there a way to get the, the titles on here with the board policies? Um, at some point, so that, so I don't have to keep opening them up. Sure. It, well, just like in the list of attachments, because we list. just see the number yeah. when we look but, at it. We just but see we the can't number tell what it is. ARP. In twelve C, it you have the you have so something I, about I, each policy. Yeah. Anyway, so just something so that that might be easier to, to go down the list here. Okay. So board policy sixty one seventy two, which is gifted and talented student programs. Matt. Yeah. So this is sort of. For, uh, comment for the combined BP and AR, even okay. though they're, they're separated, which okay. is that um, since we don't receive any money for GATE anymore, we don't really have a separate GATE program, and this is an optional policy, I'm, I'm not really sure wh why we have it. I mean, I, 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 that doesn't, not having a GATE policy doesn't mean that we're not serving the needs of those exactly. students, it's just that we're not serving the needs of those students through this separate uh, you know, through this separation, and so as a result, this policy seems entirely geared towards a program that we just don't actually have. And so, um, the gifted and talented stu ed education student program, the GATE program, um, really came about when we did have categorical funds. Mm 
And so there were many schools who would use those funds that we received from the state for GATE um, to have add staffing for gifted and talented students and they have um, primary classes or intermediate classes. Some school districts have entire schools funded through the gifted and talented education program money. Now that we do not have any categorical programs anymore, um, I think it's, it's clear by the way that I needed to modify the policy and just the policy label itself of a program is not really current with our district practice. And so I would have a tendency to agree. It doesn't mean that we would not still identify because, uh, as I wrote in the memo, there is still value in that process. But uh, to have a separate VP and AR for a program that really essentially does not necessarily exist in our district, it seems, you know, it could go up for, for conversation. Any? So can we delete this policy? Yes. Yes, isn't that? Okay, so let's, we're gonna, we'll delete board policy 6172 and the corresponding AR. Yes, so in second reading I will delete. Okay. Um, and then we've got, I'm just trying to do this in an organized manner here. So we've got um, exec, oh, okay, so that's 13. Um, why don't we do the AR since we did all the board policies? So we did, um, there's AR 6146.2, which is uh, cer oh. Certificate of Proficiency and High School Equivalency. So this is not applicable because we're not a high school. We, we do not have high schools. Okay. So we're not. <coughs> so you're not bringing it back? You're deleting it? <laughs> we we don't have it, and so it's and it's not applicable. We don't have it in our board policy, so it's not okay. applicable. Okay, we just did that one. Okay. Uh, okay. AR thirteen twelve point four is Williams, Williams Uniform <coughs> Complaint Procedures. Can we delete? Oh no, we can't delete. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that covers all of that. Then we have the executive, executive 13, 12.4, so that's the executive memo that goes with the uniform complaint policies. Correct. Right. <coughs> okay. Uh, and then we have executive 9323.2, if I remember that is the actions by the board or bylaws. Okay, so may I go back to board policy 1330 use of school facilities? Sure. I just wanted to make certain um, in the memo that I, I did attach the uh, fee schedule which is part of the procedures that we have for use of facilities um, because I would like to bring that back to uh, the board on consent. Uh, this new policy does state that the board must approve our um, fee structure, so I wanted to make sure and point it out what our fee structure is. Yeah. Oh, just a question. Is this where the, um, I know we, we started to look at. No. It's the fees, yeah. It's good that she said that. It's like I'm yeah. talking to my wife. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, we Somebody out there may not know what you're talking about, about. <laughs> but thank you. There's four other people up here. Finish your sentence. <laughs> So, By all means, why do you go ahead? Because <laughs> I, I, I thought that would come up, and so in the memo I did address that I know Joan and Eric were going to work with Josie and, um, around lease, the lease, um, how we lease or rent to different organizations, et cetera. Right. This is really about just the evening use of a room or things like that. Okay. Thank you for clarifying yeah. that. Yeah, sorry. So, <laughs> sorry. <adroitly. laughs> sorry. I apologize. So this is the one time the right. usage, or two times, rather right. than the uh, ongoing uh, rental. Uh, uh, yeah, to use the gym or multi-purpose room and things. Like okay. That. I think we covered everything. 
Can I just get a clarification on that that last one, that 9323? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's about uh, what a super majority. With action, these are actions required, requiring a two-thirds vote. Well, two-thirds of us is three and a third. Do we round that up to be a supermajority and have four? Yes. Or is yes. this, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's, the yeah, supermajority is four, four votes. Okay. Good. Just Adam a petition. Well, I just, I just <laughs> want to get clear. Okay. okay. Well, there's Steve. Eric? Just a process, because I know we're all learning to use this new system. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the ARs and memos and be, that everything on one item could be one document? Because I find it very confusing this time going mm -hmm. through and that they're all in different places and I would, you know, maybe it's just my confusion factor, but if there was one document that had the AR, the BP, the memos, so all the current policy. Yeah, everything in one that I could click on and get everything rather than back and forth. So is that the system let you do that or no? I don't think it does, no. because I think we asked that question because we wanted to reorder is what I'm hearing. Right, so yeah. even if, if even for separate items, if you have BP 1330 next to the AR, AR. Well, well, could we, you don't have could we just put that in the quick summary then? Like, so we'll have all the attachments, but then in the quick summary, we could have like a list of the order that we should oh. actually be looking at them in, and then then that would help you. So, like oh. in the quick summary, it could say like, you know, AR sixty one forty six blah, what that is, BP sixty one forty six, what that is, and then, yep. uh, you know, right. And then that, if we, that if we need to look at the specific document, we can click we could and open it, up. But it would help the president figure out what what to do in what order. Right, because at least. First of all, the public has no clue what a BP 6172 is, and frankly, I don't either. I was going to say, if we don't, it's not a good sign. Yeah, so. that's great. Got it. Is that just the system is just not as flexible as we might uh, like? You know what it looks like to me is it looks like it alphabetizes it for yeah. you because the board memo is in the middle. Oh, okay. So I, my guess is... Oh, AR, right, ARBP. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That kind of helped that and we could do that. And put things in numerical order. And put things in numerical order, yeah. Okay, so we got through all of that. Oh, now we got one more section. 12C, um, which is manual maintenance minor revisions. Now, minor revisions are a little bit different um, because it really isn't changing. Um, there isn't a law necessarily, but uh, CSBA using that uh, system feels that there are questions that sometimes come up, so it's clarifying language. Um, so that's why I went ahead and used the current PSD uh, and just showed you where the change occurred. Because if you were to use the CSBA sample, you would not see how it how the change happened. So. Okay, so we have AR 6159.4, which is Behavioral Intervention for Special Ed Students. Board Policy 9223, Filling Vacancies. Board Policy 9230, Orientation. Board Policy 614294, History, Social Science Instruction. I have one question about this time. I apologize for not getting this to you before the meeting, but I lagged. Um, that Fair Education Act should, should I, I don't see why that wasn't part of the board policy. Because and, it's, sorry, where are you looking? Uh, board policy 6142.94, History Social Science Instruction. Mm -hmm. So, um, the Fair Education Act, and we've done the board policy uh, around that one before. Um, it, it's about, you know, uh, history and social science instruction, and I, I wondered why that piece of ed code wasn't part of that policy. I can, we can um, pull it and um, I can do some research for you. I, I don't know. That's the part that said that besides just the white guys you study in history, ah, yeah. you got to study the brown guys, you right. got to study the disabled, you got to study, you know, and black, I, I, uh, do, I would gay and, and lesbian. And, yeah. 
yeah, we could probably add that, you know? So um, let me do some research but, on it. Mm -hmm. Right, because there was some ed code around that, wasn't there? Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Oh, CSBA missed that one. Yeah. But there was the weird but also thing. The, the, they've been really lagging in including that into like, the textbooks for and things like mm -hmm. that at the statewide level. Mm. Right, in terms of their statewide approval of the options. Well, they've been uh. lagging about caring about history and social science in general. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, they're working on the framework right now, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah. so I will bring this back. Okay. All right, so um, it looks like we made it through that. Good job, guys. Now on to um, our second favorite item, which is future agenda items. <laughs> So um, at our next board meeting on October 29th, if I may add, um, we received we receive this annually, the uh, county district schools data and review that we need to um, look at what schools we have and to make sure that the codes are correct and that the school still, because there are some schools that you close down or you reopen, et cetera. So every year you need to do a review. Um, I'd like to bring this back because I'd like us to have a conversation around our homeschool program at LMEC, um, being that it really is looked upon as a uh, elementary school and it's really not a functioning elementary school, so we've been in conversation with the state and um, have some recommendations that we would like to bring forward. The other thing I'm wondering about is if, um, as you know, we had the presentation for the organization efficiency review. We started sharing that and getting feedback from various stakeholders. So we're thinking that in November we should be able to have a work study uh, prepared and ready for you to have a conversation around the uh, review. So November 5th or 12th. Is when when is election day? November fourth. The fourth. No fourth. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just I just thought about that. <laughs> My level of interest. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, there'll be a lot of people busy on November fourth. Yes. So. And so you said the fifth or the twelfth. Right. Um, could we, um, besides inviting labor partners and stuff could we uh, give something out to the candidates as well oh, because we yeah for that because because that November work study will be a presentation but by the time stuff starts happening a couple of those people may be sitting up here mm -hmm. so it may be worth it not to have to repeat is it I mean if that's if that's the case is it worth putting that work study in December just so that whoever those people are can actually be at the work study as board members I mean it seems like if, the, if there's no I mean, I, this is the kind of thing where like no action right. is going to happen right. for some time on it so it seems like it makes sense to not rush and have a work study about it because we're not rushing to do anything about it tomorrow so I guess the only thing and I kind of thought that too is I know that Eric had a lot of questions that we didn't address the other thing is that I think some historical perspective on okay. some of the organizations. He can still come. Call. It's public. You're not married, but I knew that's what you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I will come. I will come after. Okay. So, I, so I, you know, since Eric and I are going off, I will leave that at the pleasure of the three of you, what you think is best then. Whether you would like to do it earlier or whether you would like and I'm glad to come as well. You haven't got unit just because I'm leaving. You're not getting rid of me. <laughs> I'm open to doing it either way. It was just okay. a, you know, it was just a suggestion since this is a more long-term thing. At the board's pleasure. I defer. If you want. Okay, to I'm making so a decision. We're having a uh, November work. Oh, did you have uh, some? I was just trying to check my calendar to see if there are oh. any times of work here. You know, I think any months. I mean, I can go either way, but. November 12th or November um, well it would probably be the 5th or the 12th because the 19th we have a get, uh, meeting and then the 26th I think is Thanksgiving yeah yes 
Or twenty seventh is Thanksgiving. Yeah. So the fifth or the twelfth. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I can do the twelfth. I can't do the fifth. Would you like the twelfth? Twelfth is fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. The work study. Or. Um, anything else? A quick question about the when is um aren't they supposed to do uh, a further facilities report about uh, like enrollment and uh, facility mm -hmm. adequacy and that sort of thing? Isn't that part of this whole? Am I getting this confused with a different report? No, um, I think we included that when we did our um, staffing. So. We did not include that this time. No, and we, we might have done it. I want to say, um, I think you were asking separate questions. Oh, projected enrollment. So that would occur in April. Yeah, no, no. But I don't the mean, like, I thought school services was supposed to, was, was as part of their assignment, part of it was this uh, staffing report that they did, but there was also. We had the um, the work study with oh my goodness I can't remember her name I want to see thank yeah. you yes <laughs> okay Josie knows what I'm talking about <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm talking about but Josie knows what I'm talking about what am I talking we, about we put that on hold until we could get a director of um, facilities and then we're going to re look at that okay so that's but that's a separate that's yes. that wasn't mm -hmm. school services and that's not connected to it this. is school it services, is school but, services but, but we would have the commission or a this. contract with a different yeah mm -hmm. report okay this, this thank is, you this All is right. people and and right. how things are organized right so my suggest I, what i yeah, thought right. was i was thinking if these two things were both going on that maybe we could try to wait until they did that and fold them into a single work study but if you want to go ahead and have a work study about this segment of it that's fine yeah, because I don't know when we'll be ready for gotcha. that one. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And part of that piece is we had, when Eric and I met as our little subcommittee on lease and rentals, we had asked um, Josie and Joe to um, do some research on gotcha. various things that would help. And that's a, at that. six, you want to do that? Right? Yes. Okay. Well, and it occurs to me that I, I guess you'll do it when we do the reorganization, but clearly Joan and I are not going to be continuing on that particular subcommittee. <laughs> well, only as community members at the recall. So you got to get some new, new blood? Yes, yeah, so we do that in December. Okay. Yeah. So uh, something else that we need to look at is um, with new board members coming on, uh, and we just looked at the board policy about orienting. Um, that uh, about orientation oh, for yes. board members, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think what might be helpful if if we if we go ahead and um, figure out when we're going to do that work study or or plan this for a future work study, um, we talk to new board members about how to read that stack of board policies <laughs> in three days. Um, that is daunting, and that it's you know so it's a better way to do and how to read that. That hundred-page budget that uh, Josie sends to us. So what? What my plan is upon getting our new board members, plus we go to the CSBA conference, that I can sit with each one or whomever uh, as a group or individually to, because I think that that's a, a great suggestion about how to read an agenda and how to go through board policy and what are some practical ways of doing it. Um, I don't think that it necessitates a meeting um, because I don't know if everybody wants to attend and or uh, it's, it's really a training I see it more than having it as an agenda item or agenda is that does that make sense okay and I think in our weekly president's meeting one of the things I had is to kind of come up with some ideas like that what that we might put in terms of either training or any kind of other structure to, and we to do, support we, we have that binder now yeah. so mm -hmm. you know what people do with binders yeah well not here. so anyway so Andrea maybe you and I and Wendy can awesome. have some of that conversation and then when the new board members come on they can also um, include you know so that provide information of what they feel they need in terms of support as well yeah Okay, Richard. Yes, sir. Uh, 
At some point, could we revisit the lice policy? The what policy? The lice policy. <laughs> okay. Uh, you were the only one here when that last decision was made. Oh, yeah. This current board, so I, I would like to look at that policy again, especially given that we're having problems with it. If, if people want to discuss oh, it, I think we should discuss it. Okay. All right. So, and you want to do that before November, then? Well, it sounds like it's a current issue. So. Okay. So, okay. So, Wendy and I will work on getting it on either the October or the November um, agenda. Okay. All righty. I also wanted to remind everybody, since I see the SIPSA work study on, on there, and that reminds me to, um, once again, please beg the principals if we could get the SIPSAs with some considerable advance before that work study, because it is a boatload of paperwork to, uh, to read, and then we have a meeting the week after that that we're going to have to read a boatload of paperwork for, yeah. so I would really, really appreciate a little bit of... I, and I know how tough it is on them, I do. No, I, I think that... Uh, the 13th, as a matter of fact, this Monday, they're going to kind of do a run-through. So um, I think it's pretty close to being complete okay. to be able to show with you. Because okay. we did try to do that timeline, giving you about a week. week. To, mm -hmm. to, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, to kind of get through it all. Thank I you. Know. Please thank them for me. Yeah. <laughs> you get to thank them yourself. When That's you true. I get the work <laughs> study. <laughs> so, okay, anything else? All right, meeting adjourned at 8.37. To closed session. And back to closed session. Closed session. Okay. 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 Can we take five before? Yeah, I think we we'll need a Before more of this, I, I can tell. <laughs> do we need to, do we want to hear about goals for next year? Is that not already in that um, the document, the 1415? Can you stay for just a minute sure. and we can, we can, no. we can re regroup? No. Boy, we're pretty tired tonight. Huh? <laughs> 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 yeah, we'll just say, Jim, it's officially October. <laughs>